Now is the time for fishing. If you mean to ever try, get your tackle ready. It's no use to keep them dry. Shoot your nets out on the briny and all them in again, and you'll get a funny shimmer in the morning. <laughs> It was night and it was dark and there was about ten men who just pulled these nets manually back across the rail. The lights of the boat were like sparkling diamonds and that's when I realised I was hooked in the fishing because there was a certain magic that still is about it. As an island nation, fishermen have always been an important part of Britain's heritage. For centuries, in an environment tinged with danger and promise, fishermen have fought to bring home the sea's riches. There was ling, cod, skate, turbot, conger, dogfish, every fish you could think of. In the early years of the 20th century, catches were good and fishermen could make a living. But as the century unfolded, a revolution in technology took place. More and more fish were caught and stocks plummeted. While some fishing communities survived, others went to the wall. I started on that ship as a 15-year-old boy and then I'm seeing a tug towing it away to go to scrap. It hurt, it hurt a lot to see that happen. Many of these changes were filmed, sometimes by the fishermen themselves. And through their home movies and their memories, we'll discover how the revolution unfolded and what life is like now for Britain's fishermen. The fishing vessel, the Crystal Sea, is out hunting for white fish off the shores of Cornwall. The brothers, David and Alex Stevens, share the skippering on board their family-owned boat. We've had a good working relationship, we've worked together for as long as we can each remember, so I wouldn't really want to be doing it without my brother. It uh, jobs a lot easier when there's two of you at sea to help each other many things you have, so you know, we're glad to be working together. David and Alec and their crew are a rare breed. Once, people like them were the mainstay of fishing communities up and down the country. But the dramatic decline in the fish stocks has seen the numbers of fishermen themselves fall sharply. The Stevens family comes from St Ives in Cornwall. It's a place with a long tradition of fishing. The town has always been a magnet for tourists and artists, attracted by the light and its setting on the coast. And by the 1930s, visitors were bringing cine cameras with them, recording all aspects of local life including the thriving fishing industry. The fish we laid out on the lifeboat slip. And they laid out small place, big place, turbot, or whatever, and then there used to be a man who used to come with a bell and he ring the bell and everybody used to call round. Then he would start the price and oh give me half a crown for this line of fish or that line of fish. And it was hard to get any money for fish in them days. People were very poor and very hard going all the time. This was a world that Donald Perkin knew well. Just like his father and older brothers before him, Donald was to follow his family into fishing. They got me in all skin and 
sea boots, and away I go, say, at 14 year old. Well, I didn't want to be a fisherman, and I wish I'd never seen the sea the first time, because I, I, while the men was eating, I was bringing mine up over the side. Sick, first time at sea. While Donald's family, like all St Ives fishermen, hunted a whole range of fish, shoals of pilchards had for generations been an important part of their catch. Well, the pilchard fishery was essentially a big export fishery. It relied on the Catholic countries, mainly Italy, but certainly in the Mediterranean countries, who were looking for stocks of fish to eat through the Lent period. And the fish were caught, uh, cured with salt, packed up in barrels and exported in sailing ships. Now, of course, when you get into the 20th century, sail is giving way to steam and then motorboats. Mounts Bay was full of pilchards in them days. And uh, I was in a boat over there called the Hesperian, and we had to cut the nets away. We had so much pilchards. I forget how many nets we used to carry, I suppose, about 15 nets, 150 yard long nets. And they're meshes, small mesh nets, where the pilchards used to go in, and then they're fast in the net. In these years between the wars, St. Ives bustled with activity connected to fishing. There were boat builders, basket makers, fish sellers, and people making and repairing nets. Years ago, when we were youngsters, the, the older men used to do all the, mend all the gear, and they were called shore captains. That was their, that was their job. Well, the fishermen were at sea, they would uh, sort the gear out, but now, of course, everything's cut out and just the ropes are sent down, and no mending of this stuff as such now. Chris Kerr is one of the few remaining net setters in Cornwall. And this net is for wreck fishing. Off the coast here is masses of wrecks. And this is for wreck fishing for fish like Pollock and Ling and Coley, basically. When I get the net in the packet, it's 200 yards long, but when I put on the rope, it's 117 yards. So that gives a slackness in the net. Well, if you had it too tight, like that, the fish will just not mesh. So you have slackness in the net, so when the fish go into the net, their gills get stuck, and that's how you catch them. Fishermen all round the coast were subject to the elemental forces of the sea and the weather. Theirs was dangerous work, and religion was always an important bedrock for these isolated communities. Well, it was very, very religious here. St. Ives men would never put their boats out on a Sunday, not out in the bay. Well, I was brought up with a Christian family, but I was a bit of... Black sheep, I think. Out of, I used to have a drink now and again on the quiet and then go down and wash my mouth out with salt water before I went home so mother wouldn't smell me. <laughs> as well as the chapels, fishermen's lodges were part of the fabric of local life. They were a haven where fishermen could rest, plan, and talk amongst themselves. Gossip, all right, they tell you what's what, and who stole this, and who didn't steal this, and who gave fish away, and who didn't give fish away, and whose wife is carrying on with who, and who wouldn't. If we was in here and a woman wanted her husband, she would never come in through the door. She'd open the top door, like that, and shout in, Dick, Fred, or whoever she wanted, but they've never come in here. They wouldn't ever come in here, and the same as board a boat. A woman wouldn't go board a boat. She would shout to her husband, but they wouldn't let her board the boat. Men thought it was bad luck, I suppose. They would never start a, a season on a Friday, because they reckoned that was bad luck. Vicar coming down the quay, that was out. And there was a, and there's a certain furry animal that lives in the burrows with big ears. They would never mention them. They were very bad luck. 
and you weren't allowed to whistle at sea because you were whistling for the wind and definitely no pasties. Pasties was out. I remember here, this summer it was, going to sea in the small in the sepia and next thing this youngster took his pass out and I shouted, hey, what are you doing with that? And, and the skipper, Ron, jumped, thought somebody had fallen overboard. I said, look, he got a pass here. Bad luck. I said, oh, no, 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 don't be so silly. And within 10 minutes, there was a big bang, the hydraulic pipe burst, and we drained out all the hydraulic fluid. I said, I told you, pasty. <laughs> St Ives was just one of hundreds of coastal communities around Britain that were making a living from the sea. And across these communities from the tip of Cornwall to the eastern shores of Scotland, people were recording their lives and work on film. You've got to have an eye for photography, or if you like, and I seem to have a natural eye for it. And you'd be looking to record the, as close as you could the, the method it being used. We used to think the skipper's job was an easy job because he'd one hand hanging on the wheel of his window and the other hand using a camera. Donald was just a boy when his father first filmed him on the family boat. When I was six and first went out to sea, it was to the, the, the heron to the drift net fishery, which was on its last years, really. And my memory of it was arriving at the fishing grounds, the crew putting boys onto different parts of the nets. There was a big, heavy rope at the foot, and then they, they just lay it to the tide for hours and hours and then. In fact, they stopped the engine, and I found that really scary. But I couldn't sleep then because there was this creaking and noise going on, a whole wooden boat working itself to death, I thought. And it was, it was at night and it was dark. And there was about ten men who just to stand and use just pure muscle and pull these nets manually back across the rail. And as they came across the rail, there was the herring stuck in the meshes and they shook the nets and the lights of the boat were like sparkling diamonds. And that's when I realised I was hooked in the fishing, because there was a certain magic still is about it. When I was watching out the wheel of Swindy, and here's him, he was, he was unable to lift the whole basket, but he, he was taking fish out of the basket and then putting them down into the hole. A chip off the old block, Oh, it's here. Donald Senior is one of a long line of Anderson fishermen from the port of Peterhead on the northeast coast of Scotland. His grandfather began working life as a whaler. I spent a lot of time in my grandfather's uh, house, and I used to listen to all these stories, and he stood away in the John Moy and a whaler going to, to Greenland, and when the casks to get the blubber in, my father went to sea with me for nearly 30 years. Well, my father uh, can learn me all about the fishing, the merely work inside of the fishing. Well, we went to the same church, and uh, he came in, well, he just fancied me, and that was it. <laughs> I always say, there's only two things could ruin a, a fisherman. is a bad engine or a bad wife. And if you couldn't trust your wife, I eh, sure her when you was at sea, you was in trouble. When I when I got married, well it was just it was just a different life. He went out to sea and I stayed at home. It was a herring. It was all the herring then. As this amateur film from the nineteen thirties shows, herring was crucial to these communities. The Anderson family was carrying on a long tradition of hunting the fish as it showed along the coastal waters in huge numbers. 